Hey, Gary Hoover here. You know that I love books. I live in a library with 55,000 books. I've done a number of video book reviews, which seem to be pretty popular on my YouTube channel, Hoover Bits. Um, and, and you can find a guide to them also on Hoover's World, my website. Anyway, I don't review a lot of brand new books. I usually get a lot more wisdom, if I can go that far, out of older books because I have the added perspective of time to see whether they were right or not or where they were right or wrong. So I can, in thinking about them, add my own dimension and learn more. But there are some good new books occasionally. I got to say, most business books, and I've bought a fair number of them, should have been an article at most, 20, 30 pages. To be able to fit on a bookstore shelf, it has to be thicker and a publisher's got to make it like 200 pages or whatever. And uh, so they use example after example after example. So I'm a big advocate. You don't have to read these books cover to cover. It's just going to waste a lot of your time. In fact, the most downloaded thing off my website is how I digest a book in 15 to 30 minutes. Some take seems a little longer, and it takes longer with the reference books, and it doesn't work for novels. But in any case, so I'm a little wary of new books. But here's uh, some new books that I would recommend and some thoughts on some. This book is called The Innovator's DNA. And it's by a guy named Dyer, Gregerson, and Christensen. Now, of those names, the best known one is Christensen. He is Harvard Business School's kind of guru of innovation. And it's called The Innovator's DNA. Okay, and um, the thing about this book, these people did a lot of research, talked to Jeff Bezos of Amazon, Michael Dell, a bunch of other people and found out what made them different from a normal executive or, you know, a corporate executive. A lot of, some charts and some cool data. And, and what they found was that they did um, four things as like habits more often than most people. They did questioning, observing, networking, and experimenting. Well, I was pleased with that because in my 10-year-old book, I talk well, whole books about questioning. I actively teach observing. I talk about that in my book, and I teach that in all my courses. Uh, and networking goes without saying. Experimenting is another one of my big ideas. Uh, so, hey, I think they're right. <laughs> anyway, but the interesting thing is when I studied all those people, and they talked to like 100 or more, something like that, different uh, founders of companies and stuff, not just two or three, they found one overarching thing, one meta thing, greater thing that tied them all together, and that's what they call associating. The power to put two ideas together nobody's put together before. And I have been preaching this for years, that most great business breakthroughs or any kind of breakthrough is just two things that everybody sees every day, but you see them in a new light. You combine them in a new way. And, and on my video blog, uh, Hoover Bits, within YouTube, uh, there's one called a Grid thinking and that's what that's all about because here in my book 10 years ago I have this grid that I show and if you can see it there but it's how it shows you where the companies I invented a uh, book stop uh, what became Hoover's how they fit into this this associational thinking of taking two basic things I won't go through that all now you can go and look at that YouTube video it's called uh, a grid thinking and, um, and and learn more about it or get one of these books. My book, it's out of print as a paper edition, but you can buy um, a PDF for $10. It's a new and improved, much thicker version. I added a bunch of chapters uh, on scribed.com, or scribed, whatever, S-C-R-I-B-D. It's a place just full of PDF files, both free ones and ones you can buy. Mine's $10, and the title of my book is The Art of Enterprise. I guess I should put that up here too. So, um, and it goes into a lot more than just uh, grid thinking and how to dream up ideas. Uh, enterprise, okay? So, uh, there's two great books. <laughs> the Innovator's DNA, current book, and now, it used to be called Hoover's Vision, The Art of Enterprise. That was my name for it before the publisher got to it. They wanted to connect to the Hoover's company I started, and I'm uh, Art of Enterprise. But then, as I'm going around looking at books, I found this one also. I think it's a recent book. I just discovered it. Copyright 2012. I guess that's recent enough. Although they cheat a little bit. Sometimes they'll ship a book in November, December, or even earlier and put 2012 on it. This is Scott D. Anthony, The Little Black Book of Innovation. And I haven't read the whole thing yet, I'm doing my scanning. Little Black Book of Innovation. And um, all these should be at your local bookseller 
or at Amazon. The author's name is Anthony. And it's just got a bunch of little tips, a few pages on each. They talk about who are some of the great masters of innovation. And while some of them are kind of undeniable, um, Clayton Christensen, <laughs> Peter Drucker, the greatest management thinker who didn't run a company, Edison, not too shabby a guy, um, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, one of the great economists who really understood how entrepreneurship works. Some of the others are like more recent and current people. I think the case is kind of still out, but they include some of my favorites like former uh, Procter & Gamble CEO A.G. Laffley, Bill James, who is a baseball statistics guru and looked at baseball in a whole new way, um, and, and, and some other interesting folks. Anyway, um, but I did notice as I went through their ideas, uh, um, they talk about what are the seven deadly sins of innovation, what to avoid, but they have all these different ideas. So here on day eight is go to the intersections. Quest, central question, how can I get inspiration for an idea? One sentence answer, go to the intersections and borrow liberally from other contexts. Well, the bottom line is these same ideas over and over, different ways of saying them. These guys look like they have a bunch more different ideas. My, my book contains a lot more ideas than just the intersection grid thinking associating idea. But it's interesting that all three of us, or however many authors involved in all these books, five of us, came to the same conclusions. And they did it by talking to lots of famous entrepreneurs. I did it through experiencing entrepreneurship and thinking hard about business and innovation since I was like 12 years old. So um, those are all good books, I think. Another interesting book, I think it's more like a year old, a really strange title. You really got to, you obliquity, write it over here. O-B-L-I-Q-U-I-T-Y. The author's last name is K. Hey, it's an easy name. How about that? John K. Okay? So, you know, an oblique angle is one that comes in like that. It's, a, it's coming at things like differently. Well, he talks in here about if you study some of the great companies, uh, oh, he talks about um, Merck, the drug company, M-E-R-C-K. We used to be a great company. Still a good one. But anyway, he talks about how they when they were driven to make great prescription drugs, great pharmaceuticals, cure diseases, they set all-time records and profits. They were just a money machine, a wonderful company. And then they got a leader who said, our goal is to make a maximized profit, to make the most money, and their profits went down. And he talks about how doing what's the obvious goal usually doesn't work, that it's a, it's, it's a kind of a roundabout and oblique process. Well, I found the book pretty stimulating. It's a nice little thin one. That's always fine with me. The last thing I'd say, so I, I, I would add that book to your reading list. The last one I'd comment on, it came with great reviews on Amazon and everything, but it just upset me so much. Uh, I, I don't get um, upset or, or uh, nasty very often. I believe in optimism and I look for the good things in life and try not to waste my time on the bad things in life. Um, I have, my energy is too much, too valuable to get angry. But this is just such an, a classic example. It's called Breakthrough Entrepreneurship. I'm not going to write it up there. Bergstone and Murphy. Maybe full of good ideas, but the publisher was too cheap to put an index in the back, which for my way of learning uh, makes it almost useless. Because the way I learn is to go through these books and, and understand key ideas and then be able to come back to them. So if I wanted to come back and say, oh, I remember in that book they told a great story about Disney or Southwest Airlines or whatever it is, there's no way I'm going to find it unless I take a huge amount of notes, which I do. But even so, it's just stupid. And from a viewpoint of book publishing, I've been a book collector all my life, a book publisher for a few years, an author. Um, a bookseller, above all else, with my company Bookstop. This is just unprofessional. And, and I see more of it. I even see it from some of the big publishing houses. This is from a publishing house I haven't heard of before called Farallon. I haven't looked into them. It's a nice looking book, well printed, that matters. The other thing is actually the spacing between the lines. I think in the industry they call it leading. It's outrageous. It's huge. It's almost like reading an old fashioned double spaced typewritten letter out of an old typewriter. And what it means is this book could have been. Well, she's 260 pages or so, 271. Uh, she could have been 180. I don't know. It's crazy. And I find it visually distracting. But it's so obviously different from other people. And it's just killing more trees to make the book look fatter. So it's kind of like the authors may be great and their ideas may be great. And I know there's some good stuff in here because I have glanced through it.
but why don't they have any respect for their own work? And you can say, well, the publisher did that, the author didn't have any control. Well, the author didn't have to sign a deal with them, or could have put a lot of pressure on them, or could have indexed it out of their own pocket. It doesn't cost that much. There are professional indexers out there. It's a lot harder than you realize, because you can't index V and A and all that. You can't just do a computerized run and say, here's the index. It's, it's very complex, especially when you start indexing phrases and not just words. In any case, um, it's really disappointing that people are stooping to this, and I don't care how bad the competition is with Amazon and eBooks and everything. And you know, an eBook may not need an index, or it may not work on an eBook. So maybe that's why they did it. It's a bad sign. It's going to hurt our ability to learn and understand if publishers keep doing stuff like that. Anyway, those are um, some great books. My top one, besides my own, would be Innovator's DNA. Start with it. If you like it, maybe go on to some of the others. This is Gary Hoover. I hope you enjoy your life as a reader and learner, and I'll talk to you soon.